companies, and uh, it's good to be back on the Gold Coast, back in my own bed. It was freezing up north. It was warmer on the Gold Coast than it was in Cairns, of all places. 13 degrees and wet, two of the days we were there. They couldn't even believe it themselves. It was just you know, very cold. Some of the people were saying they had to go into their cupboards and pull up all the stuff that they only ever take to Melbourne with them when they travel down there and get all their jackets out and to wear them again. And, uh, and uh, not enough rain up north as well. It's been all down south, so they haven't got the rain either. So it's a bit weird and um, very strange, their climates uh, at the moment. But uh, anyway, whether it's climate change or whatever, um, you know, it's all, things are all changing and, uh, you know, we know that uh, God's got everything in control and he's got a plan and a purpose, of course. And, um, you know, and as Gary said, we just we had a great time of fellowship and um, with the Fijians. I did, I did suggest to them that we, I, because they flew into Brisbane and we drove up to Cairns and I, before they bought their airline tickets, I suggested that they fly out of Cairns to Adelaide because they're down in Adelaide this weekend, um, both Pastor Aquila and Pastor Wonga and their wives. And I suggested you'll get two extra days, maybe three, if you just fly out of Cairns to Adelaide. But they bought tickets from Coolangatta again, so we had to get back in three days to get them back on the planes to get them to Adelaide. But uh, anyway, on the way down, I'm going, uh, aren't you, are you sorry you never bought those tickets from Cairns? There are another three days travelling back down again, the same roads that we went up on. But there's a re reason why you fly to Cairns. It's a long way to drive. <laughs> And uh, scrubby, bushy, you're expecting to see the tropics, but there's not much to see. I reckon the drive to Broken Hills better, to tell you the truth. Um, but uh, anyway, it is what it is. Fellowship was great, though. Had a great time. It was a bit of a whirlwind. It seemed like maybe back here we were gone for two weeks, but it was like six, seven days of driving, and the rest was all camps and rallies. So there was no space in between except for one day to the Atherton Tableland, which was 13 degrees and cold and wet. So... Um, Anyway, as I said, fellowship was great and uh, we had a lot of fun with the uh, Fijian um, brethren. All right, I'm going to, uh, apologies to Gary and Jesse, who heard some of this on Sunday, this talk, but I'll give it again. I've got a couple extra scriptures. Uh, you might, you might, anyway, never mind. Um, so it's called Revival Fire and um, the theme of the Cairns Rally was the Revival Fire Burn. And we sing that song, Revival Fire Burn. And... Um, and, you know, fire has a lot to do uh, in the Bible. There's a lot of fire talk in the Bible. And, um, you, know, you know, we sing that chorus, Revival, Fire, Burn, uh, and it's likened to the, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit uh, as a fire. And um, we read through Scripture that the Bible and the Holy Spirit and fire go hand in hand in Scripture throughout the Bible. And we see that God is a fire God. You know, we, uh, when fires go through the land, we see it's uh, devastating and it, it destroys a lot of stuff, but it also creates a lot of new growth. It also creates new life. Um, the the um, pine cone is one in particular that won't germinate without a fire. The, it's, it takes a great fire and a great heat to go through a pine forest to make the pine cone open up to release the seed to plant new trees. And so without a fire, there's no new growth for a pine tree, particular varieties of them, particularly in the United States. Not sure about the ones we have here, but I know the ones in the United States are just like that. So that you need the fire to go through to create the new life and the new growth. Um, so it can be devastating, but it can also be refreshing at the same time uh, for the forests and for those types of things. So we see that uh, this new life uh, comes from that. And um, we know that God is a God of fire. It talks about in scripture that uh, from the very start, he was a God that spoke out of the midst of the fire when he gave the Ten Commandments to Moses there on the mount. Um, so there was always fire involved when, um, when God was in the mix. The fire at the burning bush where God first spoke to Moses, that was a fire that could not be consumed. The bush was not consumed. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later, why that never happened um, and, and the way the fire works. He was standing on holy ground at the time. And uh, yeah, holy people, holy parts, don't get burnt by natural fire. Um, it can't be done. But we're going to look at some examples in Scripture. We know that uh, you know, they were good occasions, of course, when God spoke out of the fire there at the bush and there on Mount Horeb. Um, you know, uh, other times were pretty bad for Sodom and Gomorrah when, the, when God sent the fire down and the brimstone and completely uh, burned up that place of wickedness um, in, those, in those cities. Well, 
there was about five cities all up and a few kingdoms all went down with that fire and brimstone event um, and God instigated that of course and it consumed everything um, but can either see the fire of God can either consume or it can renew it'll do one or the other um, depending on the process and where you're up to but I want to take you to Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11 in the Old Testament first and particularly honing in on uh, the revival fire part of it and the Holy Spirit now in Matthew chapter 3 in <clears throat> verse 11 this is John the Baptist and he says I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance but he speaking of Jesus that cometh after me is mightier than I whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire and um, if you think about this for a bit why add the and with fire bit he could have just said he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost he could have easily have just stopped there and said that but why add the and with fire it's because John the Baptist read the scriptures like you and I they had the books the Old Testament to read he was reading probably particularly Malachi because uh, he knew he was a forerunner for Christ he knew he had a job to do he was reading scripture too just like we read but he add that last bit and with fire because he knew the processes he knew the process to how God worked and um, there has to be fire in the mix somewhere otherwise it's not going to cleanse it's not going to purify it's not going to remove the wickedness and the problems that are there so John the Baptist put these last and with fire words at the end of it and as I said he could have just stopped with Holy Ghost um, and uh, you know and, and a lot of people do unfortunately they just stop at the Holy Ghost and forget the fire bit which is um, which is a bit that cleanses a bit that fixes all of the problems okay this happened on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Ghost fire actually came it's in Acts chapter 2 and I'll get you to turn there because the start of that you've we've all read this a million times I know but there's some key words in here suddenly is actually one of them but um, key words is like as a fire in Acts 2 verse 3 and 4 this was the day of Pentecost this was when they did receive the Holy Ghost um, and it came Jesus made it very clear that he was going to send them the Holy Ghost the comforter had to wait in Jerusalem this was the day they're waiting in Jerusalem they're waiting for the Holy Ghost they didn't know how it was going to come or, or how what was going to happen I don't think they thought they'd be speaking in tongues but before the day was out um, but this was the process so they were there waiting and then all of a, and then it says and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and it sat upon each of them they're all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance and in verse 2 it says suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a mushing riding rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting so this this thing came suddenly into the room it sat upon each of them they started speaking in tongues and it was like a fire the simile was like there wasn't a fire there but it was like a fire that just spread around the room and and off it went and then they're all speaking in tongues and guess what they're doing they're in communication with God as the Bible says when we speak in an unknown tongue we speak not to man we speak to God so it made sense that Moses a few thousand years earlier would be speaking to God directly into a fire and out of the fire he was in communication with God just as they did here on the day of Pentecost they were doing in communication with God speak speaking the wondrous praises of God in their new tongue as the Holy Ghost came in a fire Holy Ghost experience and it came upon them all and there they were experiencing this incredible thing um, so this was the way it was you know it's because there's a pattern see when God sets something up he creates a pattern through the Bible and you can pick up on the pattern and you go well okay that makes sense that makes sense but the pattern is always the same there's always fire when Moses was in communication on Mount Horeb he was in the midst of the fire he was in the middle of it and when we're in communication in tongues to the Lord we're in the fire we're in the midst of the Holy Ghost and fire experience we've got the fire there it's not going to burn you it doesn't hurt because um, we know if you get burnt by a fire it hurts but the Holy Ghost fire won't harm you it it will cleanse the wickedness and the sin it will take that out of you and leave you with a body that can walk in the spirit and like the Bible says and uh, that's why the fire came and took out the wickedness and the sin and everything out of Sodom and Gomorrah that we saw that God had to cleanse it there's always fire involved in the cleansing process and uh, and fire does a great job 
at that. You know, it's because of this pattern and this process is why John the Baptist, I believe, knew to add the words, he'll baptise you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So, and if you read, we're going to read Malachi towards the end and you'll see these words are sitting there plainly for us to see and the examples are there. And if John read that, and, and I'm pretty sure he did, he would have known that it's a Holy Ghost and fire experience that's got to follow because that's the pattern. That's the way God does business. He spoke out of the fire and now we're speaking in communication out of the fire. It's the only way in this day and age you must have that Holy Ghost and fire experience. Without it, there's no cleansing, there's no fixing of the problems, there's no communication with the Lord through the Spirit. These, the things, these things won't come to pass. So we'll go back to Numbers chapter 9 and we're going to look at this simile of the day of Pentecost. And it's in Numbers chapter 9. In verse 15, and it's talking about the tabernacle here, which is you and I, the temple became, the tabernacle was a tent, uh, it became a building of stone, that Solomon built the temple, and um, we see that uh, where that tabernacle, but the tabernacle was, and the words are used correctly here in, in Numbers 9, it doesn't say temple, uh, particularly it says tabernacle for us, and it's talking about the tabernacle was a tent, and where effectively the temple of the Holy Ghost, Paul tells us that in the New Testament. So where the tabernacle, in fact, the body that we have is a tent. It's a temporary place for the Holy Spirit. The real temple was coming in the form of uh, bricks and mortar and the huge um, cedar stone, cedar wood uh, from Lebanon that, that they made the big temple with in Jerusalem, the first one. But here we go, here we see, and uh, it tells us the day that the tabernacle was reared. Verse 15 of Numbers 9. And on the day that the tabernacle was reared up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, mainly, namely the tent of the testimony. And at evening there was upon the tabernacle, as it were, the appearance of fire until the morning. Does it sound familiar? Does it sound familiar, the appearance of fire on the tabernacle, which you and I are, once filled with the Holy Ghost? The day of Pentecost, it, there was an appearance of fire, like as of fire, coming with the Holy Ghost, the day the Holy Ghost came into their tabernacle on the day of Pentecost, was reared up, as it were, until the morning. And in verse 16, it sets, it sets the pattern up for us. So it was always. That's the way it's always done. That's the way it's always been. There's always been fire. There's always been this appearance of fire and tabernacles and temples and testimonies. Look at all the key words here. You know, the reared up, the testimony... And so it was always the cloud, which is symbolic of a spirit, covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. So we see this once again, it was, it was like a fire experience. And uh, this cloud, this spirit, you know, Jesus rose in the cloud and he'll come back in the cloud. He rose in the spirit and he'll come back in the spirit when he returns to earth again. And these are similes that we see. You know, we can allude um, to that you're the light of the world and to... Uh, not to hide your light under a bushel, but shine your light. We're meant to have the appearance of light to the world as well as we walk in the Spirit and we shine our light and we're that, we're that glow, we're that beacon for the world to see that God has indeed given us the Holy Spirit. And, you know, there's warnings in the Bible of not to hide when you receive the Holy Spirit and that fire comes in, not to cover it up with a bushel, but to let it be seen, let other people know something different about you, something, you've got something, or there's, you know, you hear it in testimony all the time, you know, a, there was a glow about a particular person or something was different about that person and they see the light, they see the fire that has consumed you in your experience, like the day of Pentecost and uh, when you first came to the Lord. And when the cloud, in verse 17, and when the cloud was taken up, from the tabernacle, then after that the children of Israel journeyed, and in the place where the cloud abode, there the children of Israel pitched their tents. And um, that's what we do. We, they followed the cloud. They followed the Spirit. The spirit. They were being led of the Spirit through the wilderness. Same as you and I, we're just in the wilderness, it's this world. We're being led of the Spirit, and uh, wherever the Spirit takes us, that's where we pitch our tents. But you know, God gave you the Holy Spirit, and uh, you pitch your tent here, you know, and, um, 
And, you know, unless the Revival Fellowship starts saying you don't need to speak in tongues to be saved anymore or have the Holy Spirit and we find some other way to get the Holy Spirit, then you leave your tent where you, got, where you need to pitch it. And we pitch our tent here and, uh, in this fellowship and uh, we stay here where the Spirit is, is, is the cloud is aboding uh, with the people in that Holy Ghost and fire experience. The fire has to be there, a testimony has to be there and so it was always. It's just always been the way. And, um, and we see this right from the very start. And this was the first day the tabernacle went up, the first day it happens. And um, for the first day for all of us was the day we got filled with the Holy Ghost when the Spirit came in and we got that uh, Holy Ghost and fire experience that came in. Okay. We'll go to um, 1 Kings and chapter 18. And uh, this is a classic story, of course, uh, for Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And uh, we all know this story, so I'm just going to gloss over parts of it. Um, but in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 17 and 18, it says, And it came to pass when Ahab, he was the king at the time, and Jezebel was the queen, she was a very uh, wicked queen, saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed uh, uh, Balaam. So God's pretty jealous God. He always he tells us that clearly through Scripture. And he didn't like it when his people followed other gods besides him. And they, they, they ditched the God of the Bible, and they were following Balaam. And the king should have known better, uh, Ahab. And so should have the queen. Uh, they weren't listening to their advisors and Elijah kept telling them they were in big trouble. Uh, but Ahab thought Elijah was the troublemaker, but the troublemaker was the king and queen. Yeah, and uh, yeah, Elijah was just trying to correct it and, to, and give them fair warning. You know, and, uh, you know, we see this now at the king and queen level. Our governments are primarily and most of the world is, uh, I think, the latest census. We were down another... 12 15 percent or people that actually call themselves christian um and so they just we just we're they're abandoning at the government level and at the country level people are abandoning god they're abandoning all of those principles that our nations were built on and we're instituting laws that are contrary to god's scripture and so we forsake these things and we're in trouble the world's in trouble because they're ditching ditching god's principles and his ways of doing things you know, uh, you know, we've got terrorism, wars, starvation, poverty, disease, pandemics. Uh, the list goes on in the six o'clock news you can watch. There's nothing good on the news to watch now. You know, the, you know maybe they'll throw in the, the, the odd kitty cat story that gets rescued from a tree trunk now and again. But really, there's not much news that's worth looking at. It's just, it's just a troubled place that we live in. And... Um, you know, and it starts at the top. It can start at the government level. Imagine if the governments, if our government decided, oh, we're going to reinstitute the Ten Commandments. And da, 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 da. Well, can't see it happening, but imagine if they did. You know what I mean? God would, is on a bound to bless because he blesses people that follow his ways. That's what he does. But at the individual level and at the church level, we can do that. We can follow the Lord and we can have the blessing of the Lord, even if our governments and uh, the nation doesn't want it, we can have it at, uh, at the church level and at the people level. So here he was, this guy was troubling Israel and, and there were troubles. Verse 21 of that chapter in Kings 18, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long hold you there between two opinions? If the Lord be God, God to follow him, but if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. I didn't have much to say really. But really there's only two opinions. There's God's and everybody else's. And that's it. And God's is the one that's going to stand in the last day. Everybody else's really doesn't matter. You can have your thoughts on it, whatever you want, but it's God's word. His word will stand at the end of the day. And uh, verse 24 of that chapter, And call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. So the people said, That's a good idea. If God's true... Well, he's going to answer, isn't he? If God's true, he'll offer proof. Why not? And um, except Elijah was, you know, he just didn't pick these words out of thin air. He was reading scripture too. He knew God operated in fire. He knew God operated out of the fire. And he was calling on the fire God to do his business. And um, he put God on the spot. 
And God had to honour it. This is, this is the whole story here of Elijah following the Lord. He knew the process, as it was always. He knew the process. And he was calling on God and he's thinking, well, if God's coming, it's, he's coming by fire. That's how he proves himself. And um, here he was doing all of these things. And, they, and you know the story, they took a bullock and they cut it up and they dressed it. Baal, they did the same thing, but, the, but Baal didn't come down in fire. Baal did nothing. And Elijah mocked them and said, maybe he's gone to sleep or he's on a holiday or gone somewhere. And, and Baal didn't answer. And they cut themselves with knives. They did everything they could to get a dead god down, but he didn't do anything. So then Elijah gets his bit in verse 31. And Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And um, he was getting God's attention here. And... Uh, he was setting up the 12 stones. He was going, well, this is your people. These are your tribes. This is the way it works. And he dressed the bullock and he smothered it with water. He knew the water had to be involved and uh, drenched it all in water. Makes it harder to catch a light, doesn't it? If there's a lot of water there, the trench was full of water. And he did all of this stuff. And, um, you know, he was getting God's attention um, in the setup. And, um, of course, when there's water involved and pouring the water over it, the same thing for us. If you want to get God's attention... Um, you uh, you repent and you get baptized and that'll get God's attention. Baptism will get His attention and then He's God's then honour bound to then give you the Holy Spirit and fire experience and then you'll speak in tongues as a result, just like they did on the day of Pentecost. The fire will come. God's honour bound. Throw water all over it. The fire is next. That's how it works. That's the process always. And um, so there He was. He, he did everything He had to do. Um, and we'll go to uh, verse uh, 36. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. So he wasn't doing anything of himself. He wasn't making this up as he went along. He was just following the process. He was following God's word. And he just said, he was just, it's just what he says. He said, I'm just doing this because this is what your word says. So I'm going to copy what your word says and let's see what God does next. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. There's no doubt now. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord hears God, the Lord hears God. So we had a generation of believers here for a while until they defaulted and the next generation grew up and didn't believe any of this and decided, oh, that's not the way it's done. We'll find some other way. There must be some other way to the process. But the process never changes. It will never, ever change. It'll always be the same. And, um, you know, people say we're sticklers for repentance, baptism, and receiving the Holy Ghost with the Bible evidence of speaking in tongues. Well, too right we're sticklers for it because that's the process. That's always been the process. There's no other way to get to get. Flesh and blood won't inherit the kingdom. It doesn't matter how much, how much you love God. It doesn't matter how many orphanages you build in a third world country. It doesn't matter what you do without Holy Ghost experience. You've got nothing. You've got no starting point to get you off the ground. Um, you just have to follow the process as to how God sets things up. So we have all these uh, people here. They're doing that thing. Now, you wonder, if God didn't answer Elijah by fire, what would have happened? You can give me an answer if you want. It's not a rhetorical question. He's a dead man, wasn't he? They would have killed him. Absolutely. He's a dead man. It's no different. God doesn't answer people today by the Holy Ghost and fire experience. You're as good as dead. You're just walking around a dead person because you haven't, it hasn't happened. The Holy Spirit hasn't come. The blood of Christ hasn't cleansed the whole process. The, Jesus died. He gave his blood so that the fire could come because there was always a, a blood sacrifice and the fire always came down and consumed the sacrifice for the atonement for the sins of the people in the Old Testament. That was always the process for getting rid of sin. So blood's Christ. His blood flowed and then the fire came. And um, that is the process. He was as good as dead if God never honoured his word with fire, with the fire process. And, um, and he must have known this. And of course, I'm sure he was pretty happy when the fire came down because he wouldn't have survived. He would not have survived that journey. And neither will anybody else. 
that's not filled with the Holy Ghost. They won't be changed in the twinkling of an eye when Christ returns. They will be judged on Judgment Day. That will happen, but that's a thousand years later. If you want to be in the first resurrection, you have to have a Holy Ghost and fire experience. You have to, you have to singe the flesh with the fire of the Holy Ghost so that that body can rise to meet the Lord. And it will be changed anyway on the day. The Holy Spirit will change your body just like it did Christ's body. And he rose from the grave and the Bible says if he did, then you will. And um, he's the first fruits of the church to go through into that realm. And the church will follow Jesus Christ through that realm at his return. Now we see, we see in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 3, I'm only going to read that one verse, but I'll probably throw it on the screen for you. Tap verse 25, Daniel 3. And this is the story of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And uh, they're righteous men. And uh, they, didn't want to, they weren't going to bow down to the gods of King Nebuchadnezzar. They weren't going to do that. They were going to keep serving the Lord. They were going to follow the process and maintain their testimony. Um, and there they were. And so they had to be thrown in the fire. That was it. So they're going to be thrown in the fiery furnace. And we'll take up the story in Daniel chapter 3, verse 25. It says, he, that's King Nebuchadnezzar we're talking about here, answered and said, lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the son of God. So in the mix with these three guys walking through a very hot furnace, not getting burnt a bit, not even singed right, completely safe in the fire um, because they had, they, they, were, they were right before the Lord back in the old process, so in the Old Testament process, they were righteous and they were right before the Lord and the fire can't kill the righteous. It's not going to, this fire is not going to kill them. And who's in the mix with you and I as we walk through this world? Well, Jesus is with us, isn't he? He says, I and the Father will come and make our abode in you by the Spirit. So in the middle of the fire with you and I walking in the Lord is Jesus, the fourth person. And he's there with us in that mix and in the furnace. And uh, as we're walking in the spirit, we're constantly walking in the furnace and it's burning all the dross and everything away. The world can rub off, but it'll just keep, it'll keep getting burnt away. Like we see scriptures like the gold, our testimonies like gold tried in the fire, getting burnt and purified and burnt and purified and melted down and the junk burnt out of the metal constantly keeping us pure um, because the world will rub off. But we, we, we're in the furnace, we're in the fire experience and here we are and, and Jesus is with us in the mix. And just like these righteous men were there just walking around in the fire and the king says, someone else in there, someone else is in the mix and... That's the Lord, of course. And there he was in the mix. And, um, you know, and, and it didn't burn them. It didn't hurt them. And um, the fire will not harm the righteous at the Lord's return either. The Bible talks about the world will burn as an oven. But we'll just go to First Peter chapter 1 and verse 7 first. <clears throat> as we're going to get into some future stuff now. So we've had a look at some of the old stuff. But what's coming is uh, the Lord said he wouldn't uh, reset the earth by water next time around. It was uh, by fire. So we're going to see a lot of fire coming at the Lord's return. Uh, I don't know the extent of it, but I don't think it's going to be pretty. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7 to 9, it says that the trial of your faith, or your testimony, just maintaining your walk, walking in the Spirit, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honour and glory, at the appearing of Jesus Christ, you know, um, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom, uh, though now ye see uh, him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. You know, just like Elijah here, got an answer by fire from God that saved his soul, saved his life from, from false religion and from the from uh, everything that was going on in his, theirs was this experience. Everything that was false about the world was taken care of with the fire that came down from the Lord. And there he was, you know, these, uh, the gold that's, uh, you know, tried and, uh, you know, can be just over and over again. We're just, we're in the world, but we keep getting tried. Stuff gets chucked at us. But if you're walking in the spirit, the fire's just going to burn it all up. You know, uh, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and they walked on the ashes of the men that threw them in there. Right? They didn't survive it. Flesh and blood didn't survive that fire, but the three righteous guys did. 
in the mix with the Lord. They survived the fiery furnace. And so will the saints of God. The day will come when the fire will come and the saints will be, will be safe. You know, the gold, had, um, had been, if you go to Sovereign Hill in Ballarat, it's a gold mining town. Um, there's, a, there's a little thing that they do there. They have a $100,000, it's probably $200,000 now, bar of gold, solid gold. And they pull it out and there's a security guard standing over in the corner just in case somebody wants to take it <laughs> instead of watch the show. And the guy whacks it in this fiery furnace. It's super hot and melts the gold to liquid and then, and then uh, melts it all down to liquid and then bits burn off it, bits of dust. You can sort of see it. It's, it's got a glass door there. And then he pulls it all out and then he pours it back into the mould of the brick and then, and then waits for it to set and then puts the gold bar back in the safe at the end of the show. And uh, I actually asked him, I said, how many times have you done this? He said, oh, hundreds of times. And I said, do you, you don't lose any gold? He said, no, don't lose an ounce. You can't lose any gold. It just burns out if any dust or anything settles in it, it just burns it out the next time. But you don't lose any gold. You don't lose a drop of it, he goes. It's been the same $100,000 bar of gold, he said, for years. And um, so, you know, the gold tried in the fire, you know, we don't lose anything in the process. We just, we just get purer and better and get the rubbish out of our lives. And uh, this is what it's talking about here, the trial of our faith, much more precious than gold. Even though it's tried by fire, there's going to be fire in the mix every time. But, you know, we're, we're in a, you know, receiving the end of our faith, even the salvation of our souls. Like the guys, you know, that they saved their souls, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the fiery mix. Um, same with Elijah. There's always fire involved. Even, even Moses, who had saved him, you know, they wanted to uh, get rid of him. But God took care of that problem with, uh, with uh, the Korah rebellion and things like that. But we see we can't get ahead of God in the processes. You know, some people want to get ahead of God and say, oh, there's no fire in the mix or you don't need to speak in tongues to be saved anymore. That's irrelevant. The spirit was always there. And it was. From the very beginning, the spirit was always there. doesn't mean they particularly had it in them. It might have been leading, guiding, it might have been upon them. In, but in 2022, you've got to receive the Holy Spirit. You've got to have the Holy Ghost fire experience like on the day of Pentecost. It can't be removed because that's the process. It was always that way. First, Second Thessalonians and verse one, six to eight, verses six to eight. You know, we we looked at uh, how Ahab, Ahab had troubled troubled Israel, troubled the people with his uh, wicked ways and the ways he wasn't supposed to be doing things. And Elijah spoke to him time and time again to get it right. But Jezebel was prophesied; she she had a terrible ending. Poor girl. Um, but all because they just didn't want to do it God's way. That was the pro- they just if they wanted to do it God's way, or well, there would have been blessing involved. Uh, it's, so it's uh, you know God's way or the highway, I'm afraid. But that's the way it, it is. And God knows better than us. He knows the beginning from the end. Uh, our small minds aren't capable of knowing the big story or see the big picture. I don't think we're capable at all of seeing the big picture of what's coming upon the earth and what's beyond that and what's beyond the millennium. Um, but it's, it's, you know, God knows what's coming. So he's put these things in place for our, for our benefit, for us to follow so that we can be a part of the bigger picture that God has for mankind. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. So if there's trouble, God's going to recompense. God's going to get into the mix and he's going to use fire. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's pretty self-explanatory. Those verses, you, you can't mix them any other way. God's coming in flaming fire to take vengeance on those that simply trouble you and trouble the world because the world's a troubled place and it starts at the top, unfortunately. But we know that Jesus is coming back and, uh, but the fire is also coming in that mix. Uh, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, it says, But the heavens and earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The fire will come again, just like it did to Sodom and Gomorrah. It will destroy everything that's not right about this world. It will destroy everything that's not righteous, because that's what the fire is going to do. 
and it's going to come through and do its job. So the fire will come, it will either consume you or it will raise you up on the day of your return. I read some articles about, um, I don't know how they come to this information, but I read some articles about the, you know, the people getting burnt at the stake through history and people that are burnt by fire. When, if you're burnt at the stake, and um, I don't know who they asked to do this, but apparently when the fire starts burning, there's incredible pain, obviously. It hurts when you burn your finger just on the stove, right, just for a second, let alone getting, getting just being on a stake, getting burnt to death. But apparently when it's the flesh, it starts burning your skin and your flesh, and then it burns your nerve endings off your body. And when your nerve endings are gone, you don't feel anything. If In fact, they reckon it feels like a cool breeze. The, the, the wind of the fire feels like a cool breeze against your body when your nerve endings are gone. And um, so I don't know who they asked to do that. How's it feel now? How's it feel now? Cool breeze is quite pleasant, actually. So I don't know. But that's, that's what I read, and I, and I thought, well, that kind of fits. That kind of fits the Bible process as well, you know. And um, I want to take you to Malachi, and we're just going to see uh, what he has to say here. And, um, and these verses here, John the Baptist must have read these. <laughs> he, knew he, he knew where he was coming from, and uh, we're, we're going to take you back to Matthew 3.11 at the end of this, but, um, you know, And you can't be burnt twice. You can't, you can't get burnt twice. You can only get burnt once. So there's no second burning. But uh, once you're being filled with the Holy Ghost, the fire that's going to consume the earth is not going to affect the saints of God one iota. In fact, it'll probably feel like a cool breeze against you. You'll be fine. Because all your nerve endings that attach you to the flesh have been burnt away by the Holy Spirit. God's removed the nerve endings of the flesh. He's removed the sin from your body. The fire, when it comes to the rest of the world, to the unrighteous, is going to hurt. But to the righteous, it won't hurt. It never hurt Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. It won't hurt them. It won't hurt the saints of God either. Um, you know, it's going to be a, a glorious day. Well, that's why it's called the great, great day for the saints and terrible day of the Lord. Terrible for the rest of the world that hasn't got on board this process of understanding we serve a God of fire and a God that saves people in the process. Malachi 4 verse 1, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them and neither root nor branch. Self-explanatory. But woe unto, but unto you that fear my name, shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves, of the stall. All those who fear the Lord, all those that wanted to do God's way, that thought, I'm going to trust God here, no problem, no problems. The fire won't harm uh, the people of God. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Just like Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego just were walking on the ashes of those men that threw them in there. They died trying to throw them into the fire furnace, and uh, they were upon their ashes. Remember, um, sole of your feet, uh, verse 4, remember ye, and then it tells us this, and it says, remember, remember ye, uh, that's everybody, the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Why remember, why give us this one event in history to remember Moses on Horeb? Because this is where God spoke out of the fire. Uh, the verse is actually in, um, Deuteronomy 4.15 Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves for you saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire. So God spoke out of the midst of the fire on Mount Horeb and he's always been doing that same process and it's always been happening this way. Then the second example given in Malachi 4 is verse 5 Behold I'll send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And of course two references to fire. Elijah, the fire coming down, God honouring his word. Moses, God speaking out of the midst of the fire in Horeb. Both just conveniently placed in Malachi chapter 4 to give us the heads up. To join, it's for us to join the crumbs and to join the dots and to figure out that this is the way it works. This is the way you get saved. You know, this was, of course, I'll send you Elijah the prophet. This was in direct reference to Elias, which is, talks about 
in, uh, in, in the New Testament. This was in reference to John the Baptist. He was talking about, and John the Baptist, I believe, knew that this was him. And he was, the, he was the forerunner. He was coming in. And that's why in Matthew 3.11, he said, whoever's coming after me, he's going to baptize you in the Holy Ghost. And he wasn't doing it with fire. He knew that already. And with fire. He said it. John said it. He knew it. He knew there had to be fire involved. The next guy, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. That's the bit that counts. That's the bit that's going to save you at the return of Christ. That's the bit that's going to make you a Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. When the fire comes, it'll just be a cool breeze. The flesh has already been burnt away. It's already been taken care of with the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Your nerve endings are gone to this world. We're in a great, wonderful and safe place. Okay, just finishing uh, Deuteronomy 4, verse 23. Uh, actually, in Matthew chapter, well, I won't go there, but I was going to quote one little verse in Malachi 3, the previous chapter. It says, Behold, I will send my messenger, we're talking about John the Baptist here, and he shall prepare the way before me. So this is kind of jesus talking and the uh, and the lord whom ye shall seek shall suddenly come to his temple suddenly come to his temple what did it sound today Pentecost? suddenly there came a sound like a rushing mighty wind we get the suddenness we get the fire we get it all it's all there it's all there in the words in acts 2 for us to join up all the dots and to figure it out and to find out what it's talking about. The rest of the verse says, Who may abide the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appeareth? For he's like a refiner's fire, like full of soap. You know, he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver and shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness, which is what you do every day. You walk in the spirit, in the fire of the Holy Ghost. So Deuteronomy 4, verse 23, Take heed unto yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and that you make a graven image or the likeness of anything, anything else you put before God, anything else is no good, which the Lord thy God uh, hath forbidden thee. Don't put anything before the Lord, for the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. He's jealous, he's jealous over you, particularly now that he's given you the Holy Spirit, because he has you can communicate through the fire. You can communicate through the Spirit in, in, in the language he's given you that you're praying in tongues. So you're in that privileged position like Moses was standing on holy ground communicating through the fire with God through the, through the burning bush. You're in a beautiful position and don't ever forget, don't ever forget the covenant that you've made the day you got filled with the Holy Spirit because you're in this covenant and we serve a jealous God. We just got to hold the course and when the day comes, the fire God will save us like he has everyone else in the Bible the same way. Amen. I'll leave it there.